Good morning, friends. When we go back to Matthew 19, verse 9, Jesus says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And from these words, we concluded that the thing that gives a person permission to divorce their spouse legitimately in the eyes of God is when their spouse commits sexual immorality. And since Jesus used that term, sexual immorality, that's the term I used in the sermon on Sunday and in our devotion since then. A man can't divorce his wife because he all of a sudden finds her less attractive. A woman can't divorce her husband simply because he doesn't listen close enough for her liking. Such a divorce simply would not be legitimate before God. But a divorce based on the grounds of sexual immorality, as Jesus says, would be. But what does that mean? What does that refer to? Because it's quite likely, if you're anything like me, that when we heard Jesus or read what Jesus was saying, we might have actually filled in the blank for him ahead of time, automatically assuming that Jesus would say something like, whoever divorces his wife except for adultery, okay, that you, you know, you know, a divorce is illegitimate unless the other person is clearly unfaithful, unless they commit actual adultery, then you can't get a divorce. But if they do, then you can. But the word Jesus uses here is not the word for adul- adultery. It's, it's a much more general word. It's the word porneia. In the Greek, uh, porneia uh, is, is where we actually get our English word pornography from, which is a word that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and, and that gives you a hint right away, of course, as to the kind of thing that porneia points to. But when we think of the English concept of pornography, we think of one particular way in which we can sin sexually. But in the Greek, porneia refers to actually a whole range of activities and dispositions that are encapsulated by the English wording sexual immorality. In essence, this refers to a whole classification of sins rather than a single specific sin. For example, adultery would certainly fit in that classification of porneia or sexual immorality. But it is not the only way one can act in a sexually immoral way. We also have the concept, for example, of fornication, which is a word that you don't hear as much uh, nowadays, uh, but people certainly participate in it regularly because fornication refers to people having sex outside the covenant of marriage entirely. So uh, adultery would be when one of the per- people is married, they're just not married to the person they're having sex with. And so they're, they're breaking their marriage covenant, uh, they're committing adultery against their husband or their wife by sleeping with someone else. But fornication is when neither person is, is married um, to anyone else or to each other, you know, uh, be, but because sex still does belong within the covenant of marriage, uh, they are sinning against God's commands concerning when you may or may not you know, have sex. Uh, but here, here's the thing. We could, we could go on listing individual activities uh, that could and, and should be considered sexually immoral and, and therefore sinful. And people often do that. And in doing so, they can debate the grievousness of this versus that. You know, uh, th- this one, this activity is really far away from the, the line. You know, but this other activity, you know, it's, it's right up. It's a lot closer to the line. It's, you know, it's not that bad, right? Um, and honestly, we, we need to avoid all of that um, rather than because rather than looking at individual activities, say, is it immoral? Is it not? The best way to define what is and is not sexually immoral is simply this. Is it in agreement, fully in agreement? Is it in agreement with what God said sex ought to be? according to his design, or is it not? If it is, then it's not only permissible, it is good, it is holy, it is righteous. But if it's not an agreement, then no matter if it's just a little bit not an agreement, if it's not an agreement, then it is sexual immorality. um, And it is, of course, to be very much avoided. Um, And Jesus clarified and specified this earlier for us in Matthew 19, when he asked the Pharisees, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. 
Therefore, anything that falls outside of this scenario where Jesus out- outlines the, the nature and purpose of marriage and sex, anything that falls outside of this should, should be considered sexual immorality and therefore sinful and, yes, even as grounds for divorce. The marriage covenant and the sexual relationship within that covenant should be between a male and female, a man and woman. Homosexuality, therefore, is clearly a form of sexual immorality. So would any form of swinging, uh, any concept of open marriages and so on. The husband and wife ought to hold fast to one another and to no one else. They are one, the two of them together. Obviously, as we've already seen, sex outside the marriage bond completely is clearly sexual immorality as, as well. And, and of course, this just this little exercise of, of, of listing off a couple of these things drives to the root of why so many people reject the morality that God establishes in the first place. Because from the perspective of sinful men and women, it is incredibly limiting. One man, one woman, a lifetime commitment. You can't do this. You can't do that. That sexual immorality. So is that. And they see these restrictions And because they refuse to submit themselves to God in the first place, they refuse to see the blessings that God promises those who engage in things as he designed them to be because that's the nature of them. He is the God of life. What What he creates, what he designs, what he puts in place will lead to life. All right. And they refuse to admit that. Let me go on a tangent here or take this a little bit further than than what I really intended to, but I've mentioned it before. I'll say it again here. My wife and I are far, far from perfect. We have our little tiffs. We have our little arguments. We, we, you know... We're not perfect, but I can vouch that a marriage founded in God's purpose, uh, even an imperfect marriage, is still the greatest of blessings. My wife is incredible. She is one of the greatest sources, if not the greatest source, of earthly strength and encouragement and stability and wisdom in my life. And I thank God for her. And I try to sacrifice for her and show her how much I love her as well so that she can be strengthened and blessed and and that her own love tank can be full uh, day in and day out, I, I hope. You know, in fact, the blessing of marriage is so great in my life that I have to remind myself of what I said at the conclusion of Sunday's message, that there is something even greater awaiting us in eternity. And I won't actually be married to my wife in eternity. And we have actually had that conversation where I told her that I was trying to come to grips with that fact. And I I even asked her the question, you know, I know we won't be married there, but do you think maybe you'd still be willing to stand next to me while we sing God's praises? And much to my relief, she laughed and she said she couldn't imagine wanting to stand anywhere else. Friends, when you recognize the blessings and the goodness of what God made in in, in marriage, you're not worried about what you're missing out on. You're not worried about being restricted by marriage. You're more concerned about how you could possibly live without being married to that person. And so I, I, that's not really the point of what we're talking about today, um, but I, I had to say that um, just because I'm thankful to God for what he's done in my life, but also uh, th- there are so many people out there who just drag marriage through the mud. They say it doesn't work. It's just not true. Marriage works if you're just willing to submit to God and and seek him in that marriage. But but anyway, I'll, I'll leave that alone. Uh, you know, we'll get back to the point because the point of what we're considering here today is that the definition of sexual immorality does put so many activities um, and, and, and states of mind as off limits for the one who is willing to submit to God's design and purpose for marriage. Um, and it, it actually does mean that as a category, we can actually say that Jesus, uh, as a category, Jesus provides only only one legitimate reason for divorce, but in actuality, there are, are many various specific things that could happen that would be considered sexual immorality and therefore grounds for legitimate divorce. Now, even as I say that, I want to hastily remind us that unlike what the Pharisees seem to think, never God never commanded uh, or, or now commands anyone to get divorced, at least not in principle. Forgiveness is always an option. Uh, but we should recognize a very basic truth here. 
It's not just the classic example of adultery that serves as the only reason why a person, a Christian, could get legitimately divorced and be innocent of any wrongdoing uh, because they are divorced. Um, any form of sexual morality. Uh, and I, I will kind of add, you know, particularly when done repeatedly and, and hard heartedly, you know, could be a permitted reason for divorce. You know, any of the things we've already talked about um, would would do it. You know, we, we mentioned porneas, that that Greek word porneas connection to the English word pornography. And and uh, and so, you know, let me just mention that most biblical scholars that I trust uh, believe that that would be a clearly legitimate cause for divorce as well, because what is viewing pornography? but indulging your heart and mind in the fantasy of having sex with someone who isn't your husband and wife and, and doing that in a very purposeful way, you know? Um, so, so that, that would be grounds as well. And then one that maybe people don't often think about, but I think is just as true, um, is that we know from what we've already seen. And if you go to first Corinthians seven, it, it reinforces this fact all the more that, that God created marriage, uh, not for the purpose of sex in, entirely. That's not the only reason why marriage exists is just, just to have sex. But sex is an inherent part of marriage, the part of the covenant. You know, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that in the marriage covenant, the, the husband's body does not belong to himself, but the husband's body belongs to the wife. And the same in return. The wife's body does not belong to herself, but to her husband. And so Paul commands the husband and wife to not deprive each other of sex because that is an inherent part of the marriage covenant. And so it stands to reason, particularly again over a prolonged period of time, uh, if one or the other spouse were to spitefully withhold access to sex uh, to their to their to their to their spouse, well, that too is against the nature of the marriage covenant and and would be sexual immorality. Now, the point here isn't to to take what we thought was a very limited number of reasons to get divorced and now to explode those reasons so that now Christians can cold-heartedly divorce their spouses for even the slightest infraction of God's law as it pertains to sex. I mean, if you wanted to take things to, to extremes, particularly concerning our Lord's explanation of, uh, of lust and the Sermon on the Mount, you could say that a, a wife could divorce her husband, uh, a Christian wife could divorce her Christian husband simply because uh, they come across a beautiful woman in a grocery store and the Husband's eyes grow a little too wide as she comes into view. And I don't say that in any way to excuse the man in that kind of situation. He should absolutely keep his eyes away from such temptations. But once again, even as we consider the range of sins that fall under the category of sexual morality, we remember everything else we've already learned about marriage and divorce as well, which is that, yes, sometimes divorce is legitimate when permitted by God, sometimes even necessary based on the circumstances. But still, we should never run to divorce. We should never be eager for divorce or to see it as a first solution. But again, at the same time, we continue to walk a narrow path, a nice edge, so to speak. And we have to understand that the expanse of things that are considered sexually immoral, uh, sexually immoral and therefore things that could indeed serve as foundation for divorce well, these, these realizations help us remember just how seriously God takes marriage. As the author of Hebrews writes, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. In other words, pure, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Friends, remember what marriage and the union that takes place within that marriage as a result of the marriage covenant. Remember what all that is pointing to. It's all pointing to the gospel message itself and to our union with Christ. And no purer thing can be found than the grace of God that leads to our redemption. Nor could any relationship be more pure than the relationship between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Therefore, our marriages ought to reflect that purity. And so, yeah, men... Pay extra attention. Don't let your eyes linger on that beautiful woman at the store. See her, recognize her, possibly as a temptation, and turn your eyes away, okay? 
Do not let your eyes indulge in those kind of situations. Certainly don't let your eyes and, and your urges indulge themselves in pornography or anything else like that. And of course, the same could be said for the women as our, uh, as our culture uh, is, is sexualizing men just as much as, as, as it has sexualized women over the years in marketing and, and clothing and all that kind of stuff. We all, men and women, ought to be so very careful of all these things all these various ways we might fall short of keeping our marriages pure. Again, because of what we're trying to represent in our marriages. The love of Jesus Christ and the union that he brings between himself and the church is absolutely pure. Let's make sure our marriages are the same. With that, let me tell you that I love you. I pray you have a good and godly day. And Lord willing, I'll see you soon.